We must now hear from God's word, and we're turning to Matthew chapter 21, the scene which is commonly referred to as Palm Sunday. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you will say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks in the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them in the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house should be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany, and lodged there. Amen. Let's pray again. Father, at this point of the service, we pray for your special help. Bless the reading of the word and also the preaching of the word. and Make it an effective means of ministering to our hearts. We pray the mouth that speaks and the ear that hears, they're both your own creation. Grant both for your glory and praise and for our good. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When our Lord rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and what has become commonly known as Pan Sunday, he was a fulfilling prophecy. The prophecy in particular was Zechariah 9, verse 9, quoted in verse 5, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you humble, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. I have a reason to think about this passage recently, because a Muslim friend of mine, whom I've known since my student days, scoffed at this incident. He ridiculed it and dismissed it as truly pathetic. And the point he made was this. He says, you can't take the Bible seriously because it nowhere predicts such a remarkable event as the rise of Islam. Yet it hones in on such an insignificant event as a man riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and calls that the fulfillment of prophecy. Sadly, he was demonstrating the carnality of his heart against the things of God Something scripture speaks about elsewhere, because by nature left to ourselves, what's our attitude towards the things of God? The carnal mind is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. My response to that argument is twofold. Firstly, scripture is primarily concerned with the building of Christ's church, not the development of false teaching. That's the focus of scripture. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Then secondly, I would also argue that this passage has a significance that that person hasn't even begun to understand. And I hope that by the end of this sermon you will be persuaded that that is so. Sadly, there are scoffers who scoff at the word of God. And I was particularly disgusted with a comment Stephen Fry made recently about the subject of fulfilled prophecy. He dismissed the whole idea with a wave of his hand and he said, oh, that's easily explained. All you need to do is to read the passage, do what it says, and lo and behold, you have fulfilled prophecy. So all Christ had to do apparently was to just get on a donkey and claim to be the Messiah. 
and lo and behold, prophecy is fulfilled. Now, I have to admit, I started shouting at the TV at that point. Because for a man of his intelligence, he showed a utterly facile understanding of what's involved in fulfilling prophecy. It's not so easy to arrange to be born of a virgin, is it? That was predicted in Isaiah 7. Since when has anyone performed miracles like Christ performed miracles the like of which the world has never seen? Again, predicted by the prophet Isaiah. Was it just purely coincidence that Christ died between two thieves? That soldiers gambled for his garments? And that folk reacted the way they did with mocking, spitting, etc.? Were all of these things mere coincidences? They were all predicted in Scripture. And if I had met Stephen Fry on that occasion, I would have suggested to him that perhaps he could rise from the dead and appear to 500 people at once. Friends, fulfillment of prophecy is one of the foremost proofs of the infallibility of Scripture. Because known only to God alone are all his works from the foundation of the world. And since fulfilled prophecy finds its particular focal point in the life and death of Christ, it proves he's the only saviour of sinners. Friends, we're going to meet this King of Kings on Judgment Day. And if that occasion proves that we know these things without responding responsibly to them, we'll be left without excuse. Biblical prophecy is something we have to think very closely about with Judgment Day honesty. Because this is proof that God is who he says he is, and that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. Now I want to consider four points as I look at this passage. First of all, I want to begin by saying that this passage records an historical occasion. I want to spend a little time thinking about that for a moment. When I describe an event as historical, I'm simply emphasizing the fact that it actually happened. Verse 1, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, and so forth. Friends, that actually happened in real-time history, within a particular context. And it's only when we accept that basic premise that we will begin to grasp the significance of this event. Let's consider the background here for a few moments. 2,000 years ago, A man named Jesus of Nazareth walked along a barren road from Jericho to Jerusalem, the same road in which the parable of the Good Samaritan was enacted. You'll read about that in the previous chapter. Now, prior to this incident, our Lord had a very definite policy towards publicity. In short, (coughs) he resisted it. For the most part, he veiled his identity from the multitudes. For instance, he prevented some of those whom he healed from talking about what happened. Furthermore, he even told his disciples to remain silent after he revealed his glory on the mount. And why was that? This is the reason. His time had not yet come. If our Lord had publicly declared his identity prior to this, he would have precipitated a riot and perhaps died prematurely. But that could never happen. Because he had come to earth to die in his way and in his time. He was in control of it all. No man takes it from me, he said. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my father. So Christ was in control of his destiny. And that's why he remained quiet about his true identity up to this point. However, in providence, the time was now ripe for our Lord to lay down his life. Galilee had been in an excitable condition for some time. The people were expecting a great deliverer, and on one occasion they actually attempted to make Christ king by force. You read about that in John 6. But he resisted that attempt, because it wasn't the right time. But now the situation was different. That's because the Father's plan was now about to unfold. Passion Week was about to begin. The great moment in the divine drama of redemption had arrived. This is your hour and the power of darkness. And just prior to this, Christ had raised Lazarus from the dead. And understandably, the entire country was in a state of high tension because nothing like this had ever happened before. And rather than rejoice at this obvious proof of Christ's identity, the religious leaders were deeply incensed because they saw that the whole world had gone after him. 
their fame was decreasing while he was becoming more popular. And they didn't like that one little bit. Their noses were being put out of joint. And at that point, when they heard what happened, they began to plot his downfall. But the problem was this. Passover was approaching. A great feast. And that complicated things because Jerusalem would be full of worshippers. And it wouldn't do to murder someone during a feast. Or would it? Now we now know that there was a necessity about all of this because Christ is our Passover sacrifice for us. He had to die at the feast. And that's why our Lord now made full use of this occasion to present his claim to everyone. And with as much clarity as the occasion demanded, he made known his identity to all and sundry. Everyone everywhere had to realize that Jesus of Christ claimed to be the Messiah spoken of in the Old Testament. And that's what this incident is all about. Jesus of Nazareth was proclaiming to be the Messiah. And his claim would so enrage the hostile leaders at Jerusalem that within a week they would murder him. These things were not done on a corner. We need to keep this in mind. This is history, friends. It's important to remember this because the future of our never dying souls is at stake here. Fairy tales take place in never, never land. Legends don't actually happen. Fiction is the product of someone's imagination, but Christianity is set in space, time, history. And in this respect, Christianity is different from all other religions. Buddhism is not dependent upon the actual existence of a god called Buddha because there is no such god. Furthermore, many religions have doctrines and rules which have no other reason for their existence other than the fact that someone has made them up. Apart perhaps from a little help from the devil. But Christianity is different. It is rooted in events that actually happened. God ordains certain historical events that have a doctrinal significance and a practical relevance for the destiny of men and women. And 1 Corinthians 15 is a plain example of this. Christ died, there you have history. For our sins, there you have doctrine. What's the relevance of it? We've got to believe in him. And this historical event has a significance all its own too. It records for us how Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. And as Christ himself said, If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. In fact, this passage is significant enough to be recorded in all four of the Gospels. Only events such as Gethsemane, the cross, The resurrection and one miracle, the feeding of the 5,000, can lay claim to that. So this is a highly significant event. And that's where I want to begin. This passage records an historical occasion. This actually happened. And it is a bearing on our salvation. But secondly, I want you to notice also that this passage proclaims a unique person. Not only records an historical occasion, it proclaims a unique person. And the Holy Spirit has seen fit to include six verses in this gospel about Christ's acquisition of a donkey. Whereas such a vital event in the history of our faith as the cross is summarized in one line. There they crucified him. It's interesting, isn't it? God's ways are not our ways. This event is significant because God has recorded, uh, he has included six verses in scripture to record it for us. And it teaches us our lot, a, lot, a lot about our Lord's unique person. And I want you to notice several things what it teaches us about our Lord. First of all, it teaches us something about our Lord's knowledge. Known unto God alone are all his works from the foundation of the world. And here we encounter a person who possessed the same knowledge as God. Notice some of the things that Christ knew instinctively here. He predicted that there would be a colt tied at a particular place. He predicted that the mother would be tied alongside her. He predicted that the owner would submit when asked to do so. Tell him the Lord has need of him. He predicted that the colt and mother would willingly go with strangers. Not all all animals are obedient. And according to the Mark account, he predicted that this would be a colt upon which no man ever sat. And we'll see the significance of that later. And what was the outcome? Well, according to Luke, we're told that the disciples... Confess, Luke 19, verse 32. So those who were sent away and found it just as he had told them. Every single detail, 100% correct. 
Have you ever met anyone who could talk about the future like this? If I was to say to you, go down to the local Ford dealer and you will find a new Ford Cougar there, tell the manager that Jeff Ballantyne is in need of it. Do you think I would have any success if I hadn't arranged it all beforehand? You see, all of us acquire information through hearing, through learning and deduction, and that enables us to act. But our Lord was different because he knew these things intuitively, because of who he is. All things are naked and open to him before the one with whom we have to do. So it tells us something about our Lord's knowledge. Remarkable knowledge. It tells us something also about our Lord's power. He had power over the hearts of men. The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turns it in whatever direction he wants to. Notice that in the passage. These owners willingly released their beasts when it was stated that the Lord has need of them. No complaint. Furthermore, no one had ever attempted to mount this colt before. Why? Because Christ had reserved it for this moment. There's one which no man ever sat. We'll come back to that. He had power over the brute beasts. These animals went on their way with strangers. That's because he made them and he controlled them. He upholds all things by the word of his power. The same Jesus who caused a fish to swallow a coin and desire the bait on the end of Peter's fishing rod caused these animals to go submissively on their way with strangers. We have an example here of our Lord's knowledge and our Lord's power. We have an example also of our Lord's thoughtfulness. Christ anticipated the difficulties these disciples might face and he told them what to do. He said, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them. He obeyed his own golden rule, didn't he? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you so to them. He showed a sensitivity towards the needs of others. And he also showed a sensitivity towards the needs of an ass and a colt. By not separating, mother and colt would remain together because the Lord said so. God cares for the animals. So did Christ. Remember the end of Jonah? Should I not spare Nineveh, that great city in which are found more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and also much cattle? Here's our Lord's thoughtfulness, caring for the people who are involved in this incident as well as the animals. Notice also our Lord's lowliness. Our Lord had to borrow a donkey, friends. He's the creator of all things. And yet he had to borrow a donkey. The very animal he created, he condescended to borrow. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And here is his humility. He had to borrow a donkey during the period of his humiliation. Alex Campbell, minister of Lisbon Road Congregation on a past day, apparently did a little series on the things that Christ borrowed. Here's the Lord of glory. And he had to borrow certain things. Five loaves and two fishes. A boat to preach in. A tomb to be buried in. And a donkey to ride into Jerusalem on so-called Palm Sunday. And this is another reminder that the Lord was very different from every other king because his life was one of humiliation. And then, of course, the passage reminds us of our Lord's identity because he applied the words of Zechariah 9, verse 9, to himself. And in acting like this, he was fulfilling Scripture. And this event would almost certainly have been one of those that our Lord would refer to on the Emmaus Road. And he would remind them how Zechariah spoke spoke about that matter. Beginning at Moses and the prophets, he expounded them unto them. And all the scriptures, the thing concerning himself. In fact, this incident may well be the fulfillment of Genesis 49, verses 10 to 11 as well. Here's another prediction of the Messiah. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall the obedience of the people, the gathering of the people be. Binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. So throughout this incident, God disposed everything perfectly according to his extraordinary providence. But it would be just as true to say that God the Son disposed everything perfectly according to his extraordinary providence because by him all things are made together. So this passage, friends, Reminds us of our Lord's knowledge, our Lord's power, 
our Lord's thoughtfulness, our Lord's lowliness, and our Lord's identity. And quite how anyone could read this passage confessing that it actually happened without acknowledging that our Lord was a unique person is beyond me. It's obviously we're talking here about God the Son, someone unique. So that's the second point. First of all, this passage records an historical occasion. Secondly, it proclaims a unique person. Thirdly, it describes a strange coronation. It describes a strange coronation. Whereas our Lord shunned publicity in the past day, he now engineered it. His command to go get an ass sent out a very definite signal that no one could misunderstand. He was now clearly stating that he was arranging his own coronation. But this was a strange coronation. It was a kingship with a difference. It was normal enough in those days for a king to ride on a war horse. But this king purposely chose an ass. Now why was that? Well that too had royal significance because if you know your scriptures well you will know that dignitaries such as Balaam, Aksa, daughter of Caleb and Abigail all rode on asses and Solomon did as well. 1 Kings 1 verse 33. This too is a symbol of kingship. And the king said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord and of Solomon my son, ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gehom. But the choice of an ass is opposed to that of a warhorse. Warhorse sent out a very definite signal about the nature of Christ's kingdom. It conveyed the message that Christ's kingdom was very different from all other kingdoms. It was a peaceful kingdom. He'd come on earth to establish peace and goodwill toward men. Now another feature of this coronation is this. In biblical times, kings rode in procession on their way to the palace. That happens today as well. What happened after Charles' coronation? He rode to the palace. Their coronation preceded their taking up residence. And it's interesting to note that immediately after this, our Lord cleansed the temple for one last time. What was he saying? This is my house. I'm now... Declaring myself to be king, this is my house. The father's house, the place where he reigned. And that his kingdom was a spiritual one, not a kingdom of this world. And another interesting feature of this coronation is that no coronation is complete without an entourage. But once again, Christ did things his way. He wasn't surrounded by soldiers with swords and impressive military regalia. On the contrary, his courtiers were Lowly fishermen, none too impressive in their appearance. God's kingdom is different. God, for the most part, chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, the weak things to confound the things that are mighty, the base things, the despised things, the nobodies, that no flesh may glory in his presence. What Alan Martin calls God's five-ranked army of descending human weakness. Christ's courtiers are very different from other courtiers. Now, there are other strange elements in this coronation as well. Courtiers normally arranged clothes for the king to sit on. Verse 7 And the crowds that went before him and that followed him shouting was honoured to the uh, king of son of David blessed is he who comes, sorry verse 7 uh, they, they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. And once again this uh, idea was firmly rooted in scripture. It was a symbol of kingship. So we read for instance of Jehu and Second Kings verse 9 Verse 13, that something similar happened. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him in the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. However, the clothes here weren't scarlet and purple to signify royalty. They were the clothes of common people, common fishermen, which maybe even smelt a bit. Very different. Throughout this incident, Christ was saying, yes, I am a king, but I'm not your normal king. Now, kings also have a red carpet laid out for them, don't they, at their coronation? We're familiar with this. We see this imagery on TV today. If a, a king arrives from another part of the world, there's a red carpet laid out at the airport. Now, that happened here too. But the red carpet consisted of clothes thrown to the ground by the common people for a donkey to walk in. Very different. 
Now, coronation is also a joyful occasion. We all celebrate it at a coronation, don't we? And frequently the crowds show their enthusiasm by waving flags. But the crowds didn't wave flags here. They waved palm branches. Once again, another element associated with kingship, but kingship with a difference. There was no pomp and circumstance such as we find in earthly coronation. But this nonetheless was still a coronation. And of course, like all other coronations, there was song. What do people do when they're happy? They sing, don't they? People were so happy here that they burst into song. But what they sang was scripture. They sang Hosanna, which means save now. Save now. They also described Jesus as the son of David. A well-known messianic term. Look at verse 9. The crowd that followed him were shouting Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, these words were taken straight out of Psalm 118, verses 25 to 26, a messianic psalm. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. But it's interesting to note that the people didn't sing verse 22. Because they didn't understand this at the point. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's also said of the Messiah. Christ is not only a king, he's the stone described here. And let me explain the significance of that. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream? He saw a great head of gold which represented Babylon. It also had a chest and arms of silver which represented Greece. Its belly and thighs were made of bronze which represented the Medes and the Persians. The legs were a mixture of iron and clay which emphasised the Roman Empire. But at that point, a stone made without hands smashed the image into pieces and filled the whole earth. Stone made without hands. Here's the uncreated one. Establishing his kingdom, a kingdom that endures forever. And the psalmist predicted in Psalm 118 that he would be rejected by the builders, the religious leaders within the nation. And that's what happened a week later. And all of that had to happen so that he might become the chief cornerstone. You see, friends, through death and resurrection, Christ would become the foundation of a spiritual temple consisting of living stones, whom Peter mentions. Or to put it in concrete terms, and no pun intended, he is the one whom his people rest upon for salvation, just like the stones of a building rest upon the foundation. Here's Christ promising that he would build his church in the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Here's a coronation with a difference. Now Mark makes one final link with the Old Testament and his account. And Mark chapter 11, verse 2, he says this. Go into the village in front of you and immediately as you enter it you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat What is this all about? Well, many of the Old Testament sacrifices emphasize purity, originality, and uniqueness. And they were fulfilled in Christ. Here are a couple of examples. Numbers 19, verse 2. This is the institute of the law that the Lord has commanded. Tell the people of Israel to bring you a red heifer without defect. Defect in which there is no blemish and which a yoke has never come. An absolutely pure red heifer without blemish. There was a hint as to what Christ was like. Holy, harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners. Deuteronomy 21 verse 3. Another example of this. And the elders of the city that is nearest to the slain man shall take a heifer that has never been worked and that is not pulled in a yoke and Christ was now identifying himself with these Old Testament sacrifice so you see all of this was a fulfilment of scripture and throughout it all our Lord accepted public acclaim without a murmur in fact he encouraged it at other times he discouraged it but now he encouraged it listen to what he had to say to the Pharisees who requested him to discourage this public demonstration of affection and Luke 19 
This is what he said. Luke 19, verse 39 and 40. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered and said, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The time had come for him to declare himself. And our Lord told these party poopers that if the people hadn't praised him here, the inanimate stones would have done so. Friends, it's hard to see how Jesus could have spoken more plainly than he did here. If ever there was a claim to Messiahship, surely this was this. Surely Jesus was saying, I am the promised deliverer spoken of in the Old Testament. And here we have an account of how Jesus purposefully and voluntarily and sovereignly made a public declaration of who he, who he is and who he was. And look what happened shortly after this. Verse 14. The blind and the lame came into the temple and they healed them. This was an extraordinary day. What a strange combination of events. If you witnessed everything on this day, you'd go home with your head spinning. Asking Jeff, what is going on here? Friends, this is what was happening. Christ was arranging his own coronation. Although it was a coronation with a difference. And he made that point by supplementing it with works of mercy and compassion. Simultaneously the crowd sang his praises without grasping the unpleasant fact that he was the stone who was about to be rejected by the builders. Meanwhile, the religious leaders, the so-called experts, were plotting his murder. And once again it would all fall out in a way that God had planned because known unto him are all his works from the foundation of the world. That's a bird's eye view of what was happening in Jerusalem at this particular time. So here, with three things. First of all, the passage records an historical incident. Secondly, it proclaims a unique person. Thirdly, it describes a strange coronation. And then lastly, this passage raises an important question which is mentioned in verses 10 to 11. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, and here's the question, who is this? Who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And we can understand why the people were perplexed to some degree. They understood clearly that this was a coronation of sorts. There were far too many parallels with their understanding of coronations to doubt that for a moment. However, this is what perplexed them. Christ was not the sort of deliverer they wanted. They wanted a prince on a war horse who would defeat the Romans and make them the head of the nations. But here he was riding on a donkey. That's why they were bewildered. But who is this, friends? This is simply the Messiah spoken of in Scripture, God's deliverer. As I reminded the children earlier, we have great enemies. Sin, the devil, the world, and death. We can't overcome them. Who can? Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the deliverer. The only way of salvation. Remember how the Samaritan lady recognized that. She said, now we believe, not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. And friends, Jesus Christ is still on a mission of peace, so today, even today, so to speak, because he's still in the business of granting peace to the hearts of those who believe in him. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are still in the day of grace. But remember this. Scripture paints a very different picture of this person elsewhere. And if you leave it too late to do anything about this, or you despise Christ over chores of grace, one day you'll see a king not riding on a donkey, but a king riding on a war horse. Because that's what's going to happen when Christ returns. As I read to you earlier, but let me read it again. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 13. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on it no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name by which he is called the Word of God. So I just say to you, make sure that you embrace this exclusive deliverer of sinners who alone can rectify our problems. He alone is able to save us to the uttermost. 
and he does so to all who come to God by him. So who is this? He's the saviour of sinners. He's the saviour we need. And here's your choice. You either embrace him now on his mission of peace as he is freely offered in the gospel. Or you decide in your heart you're not going to have him and you recoil from that. And one day you'll meet him on a horse of war. That's the choice, friends. But now he says, come unto me, all you who labour, and I will give you rest. But if you don't, one day he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. So this passage reminds us of both the goodness and the severity of God. Amen.